we found something in our reporting. Something happening here in the one big city in Qatar. A place the whole world is looking at right now. An invisible border drawn to trap human beings, to make them work, to make them build. I want to show this to you. So let me take you back to show you how we ended up sending a camera to someone and teaching them how to shoot undercover in Qatar, while simultaneously capturing interviews in rural Nepal, and how I ended up here, staring for hours at maps drawn by the Qatari government. All of this to shine a light on something that Qatar doesn't want the world to see. Guys, a lot of people say, um, I watched the other video first. Should we do that? Guys, this looks really good. The chat. Guys, I didn't woke up chat. Guys, I, I'm telling you guys, I'm, why, I'm jaded about, uh, I'm jaded about the topic. Okay, I'm, and I feel like, so, yeah, let's watch both. Guys, guys, it's, 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 it's like an ongoing issue. It's, it's, everybody like, talking about woke up, I, I think it's a good time to watch it. I'll give this one a shot. We'll see how it goes. This is just a game, right? No. Nothing but it's not. It's just It's something. really not. It's so much more than that. I want to show you a story that feels unique to our time in history. It's a story of how the organization that controls the sport that humans love most was hijacked by a tiny country that controls the resource that I misclicked and I just timed out our bot. I think I just I just literally broke everything. Holy fuck. Oh and my god! Qatar. Well, what from the oil fuck? And natural gas. Resulting in this. A World Cup held in the desert. In a country built off fossil fuels and foreign labor. With a citizen population the size of Honolulu, Hawaii. Chat, watch this. It's important. I want to show you how this happened. How Qatar, this tiny country, beat out the US, Australia, Japan, and South Korea by convincing 14 of the 22 most powerful men in football to vote for them to become the host of the 2022 That's World Cup. That's insane. The winner to organize Hello, Felix. I'm sorry, the 2022 World Cup FIFA World Cup is Western Qatar. The South African World Cup. US does the same to okay, this is a big story and, and I'm excited to dive in, but before we do, I need to thank today's events, sponsor, one of the most that. unique I've ever been a part of. Thank you Established Titles for sponsoring today's video. So this is custom in Scotland, that if you own land in Scotland, we've been deep in this, trying to make a web, trying to make a visual that will help us understand FIFA and why this World Cup is being held where it's being held. I want to show it to you, and I've been Chat, really you know what? wrestling with how to boil it. Yeah, can I also do you guys? I want to watch only the other video. Maybe we'll watch it later. I want to watch it. I think it's, it's better. It's down, and I think Both? there's just three major things that we need to understand if we want to understand how Qatar bought the World Cup. Check this out. Make up your mind? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'll, 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 I'll give it the three major things you have to understand to make sense of this story. They are FIFA, you have to understand the World Cup, and you have to understand Qatar. All right, this is our list. If you understand these three things independently, you can put them together to determine what really happened here and how this tiny desert country ended up with the World Cup. So let's start with FIFA. That's the people who FIFA was started by seven soccer. European nations in 1904. The original goal here was to help organize matches for association football, which is the football, it's the thing we all know. It's the game where two teams of 11 players try to kick a ball into a goal. Football was no means invented here at this time at this place. People have been kicking a ball around for like a million years. But it was here in Europe in the early 1900s it's soccer. when the modern authority for football was born and born in pretty humble beginnings. But FIFA quickly grew into a transnational quasi-political authority that spans the whole globe. In fact, so this is soccer. Act. We have a map for that. FIFA global structure. What are the colors like? So this is FIFA today. It is massive. It represents 211 countries or associations that all belong to this one giant sporting organization. It's the most powerful, easily the most powerful sporting organization in the world. And it's got these six major regions or confederations. 
And it was the leaders from these regional confederations who in 2010 sat on FIFA's executive committee, based here in Zurich, in this bunker-like headquarters. I, I was actually there just a, f a few weeks ago, actually. I'm in Zurich. This is where the FIFA headquarters, the FIFA museum are. This is where the votes well, happen. Well, what, what does FIFA stand for? It's um, Football International. Foot Association. Okay, let's get back to this. Here we go. The 24 most powerful men in football, the ones who would go on to decide who would be the host of the 2022 World Cup. Here they are. They're just hanging out on our diagram. Sorted by their confederation. Oh, it makes sense. Except okay, I get it now. Right here at the top. Swiss guy. I'm going to cross it off. I'm gonna cross it off the list. FIFA, we didn't go over all of it. There's obviously way more to FIFA than what I just talked about. The corruption, the scandals, all of it. So it's, but for the purposes it's of like this NATO. video, which is trying to answer the question, how did Qatar end up with the World Cup? What we need to know is what we just talked months. about. The executive committee, the 24 most sentence. powerful men Love in football. Keep I'm gonna cross it off the list. Next on our list, the World Cup. So eventually FIFA got big enough to where they could put on a big international tournament and people would actually come. They held it in Uruguay in 1930. 13 teams participated and they called it the World Cup. It quickly became the most prestigious tournament in football and eventually would become the most viewed sports event on the planet. That's cool though, I like that. Beating out even the Olympics, if you consider that 1.1 billion people, like a decent chunk of the entire global population, were simultaneously watching in 2018 when France beat Croatia in the World Cup final in Moscow. 1.1 billion people. That's insane! The watching the same thing. I mean, that's, ins that's insane, but it's also kind of amazing. Bro, that's crazy. Like, what other thing brings that many people nothing. together? Literally nothing. It's an amazing nothing. thing, what global football has become. And that is basically thanks to FIFA. That means that people, that means that people, that people care more about, about soccer. That means that people care more about some fucking leather bullshit ass ball being kicked in some fucking linen net, okay? Than almost anything else in the world. I get him a McLaren smile? Sport has the power to inspire and unite people. I mean, you imme I'm immediately like actually almost crying. Like this is, this is beautiful stuff. Look at this. Look at this guy. Look at this. These moments of like amazing like, billions to performance and then this, the reaction of these crowds. Team. Middles but fuck. Lil it must be noted, with a zero as if you have this Ecuador, much attention on one event, 13% of the entire global Miguel population Lau. watching at one time, it will quickly become less about the beauty of this game yeah, I'm muted, yes. uh, I was just, and fuck more it. about, I mean, you know what I'm going to say, more about money. money. With so much attention, corporations pay endless money to get their logos anywhere near this stuff. Here, or here, or here. Okay, that's not that surprising. What blows my mind is how far governments will go to also pay endless money to get anywhere near the World Cup. Not because they make money in return like the corporations, they always end up losing tons of money, but because there's a power in having the entire world focused on your country for a few weeks. Together, you've given the American people an extraordinary opportunity True. to welcome the world to our shores as host of the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Chat, question for chat. Do you guys think that that that, that countries that, that host events that are extremely expensive are overplaying the importance of that and what it, the impact that it has over their tourism and shit like that? Or do you think I mean, it, look it's, at it's a good exchange? Look at this. We plotted this actually. We found this data. No. Every four years is a World Cup, and this is how much each of these countries have spent on their World Cup. These are again taxpayer money here. This is government money. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a good exchange. Cup. Throw this sucker onto a bar chart, and you get something like this. Like it's getting out of hand. Like every year they spend more and more and more. Oh, and spoiler alert, wait till I show you this graph with Qatar in the mix. Minds will be blown, I can promise you that. The point is that... Blown, I can promise you that. Wait, 200, 200, 220 billion. 
point is that countries are willing to pay more and more to get the World Cup in their country. A moment for them to put their best foot forward on a global stage. This is what so we chat said, inflation! Like to call soft power. Okay. I am crossing the World Cup off of our list, not because I covered every angle of it, but because for the purposes of this story, this is what matters. Countries are more and more willing to pay unlimited amounts of money to try to get this event in their country because a billion people are gonna watch it and it makes them look good. Okay, we're crossing it off. What's wrong with that? Right. Have you have the bag? On to the last piece of our puzzle, Qatar, a country that should be pronounced Qatar, but I'm not gonna be that pretentious guy who shows up trying to like say it in the local pronunciation because it makes me sound cultured and cool. I am that guy, I'm trying to not be that guy. So for now, I'm just gonna say it like a Texas oilman says it, Qatar, okay? Okay, hold Thanks. up, hold up, hold up. Do you want to say, what if I have a country like this, like, oh, do they have the bag, they can do this? Yeah, yeah, a lot of them you have the bag, you, you can do something. It's about doing it right, right? It's whenever you have the, it's setting up the, the infrastructure for, to, to do it right. That's, that's usually what I, the thought behind it. It's like, it's, it's like when I told chat, if you, get, if you give like, okay, well, last pause. If you, if you give charity like 500 million overnight, okay, it's gonna be dumb. Because they can't, they, they don't have the manpower and the infrastructure to, to, to use that now. It's, it, it's, it's bad. I'm gonna be really quick on this history of oh, Qatar. This chat, like, man. I'm not going into the full thing, okay? This because, oh my God, it just doesn't get it. Oh, I just forget it. It's a very oh my fucking god, I can't them. Do a whole video. Just about watch a video. It. Okay. I'm gonna give you the spark notes, which is that Qatar, for most of its history, was populated by nomadic tribes and fishing villages, whose biggest industry was pearl diving, which is like a pretty gnarly thing to do. Like. You like tie a rock around your ankle and go under to find clams and then open the clams and see if there's pearls. It, it was like hard work. The British eventually swooped in because the Industrial Revolution was happening and they smelled oil over here. Qatar becomes a British protectorate until 1971 when they became an independent country, an Islamic constitutional monarchy it's run by one family British. dynasty. So by the 70s, the British were gone, but crucially, the oil was not. And because of said oil, Qatar quickly transitioned from a poor tribal society to a globally connected energy hub with unlimited money. This accelerated in the 70s when Qatar won the fossil fuel lottery and discovered that they just happened to be sitting on the largest known natural gas field on the planet. This guy. They share a bit of it with the territorial waters of Iran, but most Sounds of fair enough. Theirs. Oh, and by the way, all this fossil fuel and the revenue coming from it belongs to this teeny country, which this is a very teeny country. Like we're talking about a country that fits inside of the sole of the boot of Italy. Look okay, this. okay. Listen, Man, the, totally wor the world map is inaccurate in but sizes though. We're talking about a few hundred thousand Qataris here. This isn't a big population. And yet they're all getting in on this unbelievable amount it's of not, It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. Okay. Like we can't. You have to get an adjusted map. Oh, you didn't use one? how oh. rich this teeny Sorry. little thumb-shaped country is. They could not okay, spend their money well fast enough. They, they didn't have enough labor to build all the stuff that they had money for, Whatever. so they started to import labor from other countries. 95% of the people who live and work here are not Qataris. They're expats from other places, 95%. Meanwhile, the teeny population that are actually Qatari citizens live very good lives. They're some of the richest people on the planet. Most of them work very cushy government jobs that pay really well. They live in a welfare state where their needs are met because there is just unlimited money for everyone in this country. Okay, that's Qatar. So this is the moment where the three pieces of our puzzle come together. Because in the 90s, Qatar starts to read the tea leaves. They start to realize that the world is gonna move away from fossil fuels, the one thing that they have. Their gravy train is gonna come to an end in a few decades. It's time to prepare for the future, said Qatar, by investing their billions and billions, hundreds of billions of extra dollars into anything and everything that is not fossil fuels. Diversify. So they start to go nuts. Everything from real estate in Singapore and New York City to buying the St. Petersburg airport in Russia to buying Miramax Films and the Italian luxury brand Valentino. Like, boy, should I just make an entire video on Qatar Jesus. investment authority? Because that would be juicy. In 2017, the BBC noted that Qatar owns more land in the UK than the Queen does. And as a part of this big diversifying strategic investment effort, Qatar focused on turning their country 
into a global hub for prestigious international events. You see where I'm going with this? Lucky for them, there guys, is a guys, shortcut guys, to the most- Buying things out is not a good thing overall. It's, it, never, it rarely or never, probably never is. prestigious event in the in world. In my opinion, anyway. The World Cup. Oh, and this event happens to be run by an organization that speaks a language that they're very familiar with. The language of money and power and influence. Why not? Okay. And here's where we are. Let me give you a shit take. Somebody gives me gives me one billion dollars right now. What one billion? So to, re to retire here, and never go anywhere ever again. These then. gatekeepers I of international I football. The people who voted on Is that a good who thing? was gonna host the 2022 World Cup. 14 of these guys voted Qatar. And I wanna know why. Qatar, a country that FIFA itself, when they were evaluating all the bidders for the hosting, decided was not super suited for this. There's all these parameters that come. Wait, holy shit. Same construction, medium risk, medium risk, high risk, low risk, medium. Decided was not super suited for this. There's all these parameters that countries should have to be a good host. Qatar didn't really have a lot of them. And in fact, they had the opposite. Super hot weather, no widespread football infrastructure, and perhaps most strikingly, not a huge tradition of football or even a significant local population to spread football to in their place. They have a couple hundred thousand people. The World Cup is supposed to bring football to new regions well, there's not a lot of grass throughout a country. It's a desert, How are no? they going to do that in a hot desert <laughs> oasis with like 300,000 people? So let's do this. We're done with our list. <laughs> let's move on to the next part of this video, which is probably the part we put the most effort into. And I want you to stick with me here mm. because the point isn't to go into every single detail of how some of this corruption went down. No one's gonna remember every little detail. That's not the point. The point is to give you a sampling of the mechanics of how influence and power works, not just in FIFA, but know. in the international system generally, how powerful people get what they want. We'll never know for certain because this vote was secret, but we know Qatar got 14 of these guys. And I think I have a pretty good 14? idea of how for most of them. I mean, they just bought them out. They just bought him out. We're gonna start with this guy. This is Mohammed bin Hammam. He's one of the executive committee members and he's from Qatar, okay? We can safely assume that he probably voted for his own country. But more importantly, it was him, a big wig international football guy who helped pull the strings on everyone else on this web. Starting with this guy. I mean, it doesn't get complicated, just buy them. Jack Warner. He's an executive committee member from Trinidad and Tobago. Leaked emails and bank records obtained by the Sunday Times revealed that before the vote, Bin Hammam deposited $450,000 directly into Warner's account. And That's it! That's it! Later, even more. 500K? Six million dollars. Just like literally like he just paid him. Like that's, this is the simplest version. Just like, I, I will pay you money to- Guys, you, guys, to, he, he just bought a key piece. A, one, one of the few key pieces that he needs to buy in order to create a project worth $220 billion for $500,000. That's like, like, dude, that's insane. What I want you to, it's just like so straightforward. No wonder a month after the vote in an email, Warner called his Qatari colleague, Ben Hammam, quote, the only brother I have in football. Okay, one guy down, who else? Next, we have the three executive oh, committee members mil. from oh, the South Oh my American God, oh my God, two mil, watch out. The chance. US Department of Justice has gotten involved with these guys. They recently released an unsealed indictment against all three of them, alleging that these three were, quote, offered and received bribes in okay. exchange. This guy says, um, yo, the ADHD, he added $1.2 million. It could have been $1 billion. It still wouldn't have been enough. What are you it's talking about? Their votes. I mean, it's pretty unsatisfying. We don't have the evidence that the DOJ is using for this case. Oh my God, this shit. They're building a case. Oh, and by the way, two of these guys just died in like the past couple of years. The project is worth $220 billion. In order to acquire it, okay, if you, if you had to spend $1 billion per piece, which is $14 billion, it's still not even a lot. That's still, that's still a 10x project. It's, that's still Next 10x up, fold. These three guys from the Africa Confederation. A year before the vote, the African Confederation was having their annual meeting in Angola which by the way was paid for by the Qatar bid Only team, after. the people who were like trying to convince people to vote for the World Cup. Well, no more pause then, I'm done with thing. it. Okay, I get it. Trying to like lobby for your team, that's fine. But here's where it gets shady. While they were at this meeting, the Qatar bid team met with these three executive committee members. And according to a former employee who was in the room translating, 
The Qataris offered $1.5 million each to these guys in exchange for their promise that they would vote for Qatar. A year later, this employee turned whistleblower actually went back on her statement, saying that she actually lied about it and that there were no bribes. Kind of fishy. What's your incentive to lie? But then the FBI showed up at her front door and she admitted that she was pressured to say that she had lied about it and that actually the bribes happened. I don't know, man. We don't like, I, I side with the whistleblower. You can decide how you feel. And now her life is basically ruined. She said in an interview that quote, I will always look over my shoulder for the rest of my life. Oh, okay, and while we're talking about this, one of those three guys that apparently got $1.5 million was later filmed by undercover reporters negotiating an $800,000 bribe in exchange for his vote. Like, smoking gun evidence. Same thing happened to this guy, the executive committee member from the Oceania region. And they actually got disqualified from voting. So these two guys didn't actually vote. Nope, you know what, chat, guys, guys. So we're now- I, I have to pause again, I have to pause. Dude, 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 these are like world altering fucking events. That, that are happening for one mil, 800k. What the fuck? Down to 22 exco members. Let's keep That's going. That's insane. Okay, so we've gone over the instances where there was direct money given in exchange for the promise to vote. The next phase of the story- I could have bought the full thing! Subtle versions Literally. of influence. Less overt, less smoking gunish. Like this guy from Thailand. He's the executive committee member from Thailand. Four months before the vote, Thailand and Qatar were renegotiating an energy deal. Thailand was trying to get a better price for their natural gas. It's not, it's not, it's not something flex, Qatar it's, 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 has a lot of. But for some reason, this guy, oh, a FIFA man. executive committee voting member, was at the meeting. Wait, what? Why is this football guy in the room while there's these big gas negotiations going on? Yes, I'm being coy. We know where this is going. I mean, you gotta read these leaked emails. They're so juicy. You got a FIFA guy emailing a Qatar gas guy from Qatar Petroleum. They're talking about the development of their two football associations from their different countries, and then saying that they're gonna liaise with the CEO of the gas company to follow up about a liquid natural gas sale. I mean, it's just so clear what's going on here. Favorable terms of the deal in exchange for, hey dude, make sure to vote for our country. Oh, and who was this meeting between the gas guy and the FIFA guy arranged by? You guessed it, this guy, Mohammed bin Hammam, the executive committee member from Qatar, who's pulling all these strings. Oh, by the way, just a little side note here, going through these leaked emails, I couldn't help but notice that the FIFA guy's email was sour piggy at redacted. <laughs> sour piggy? Sour piggy, sour piggy's doing a lot of corruption lately. Okay. How can you do so, so. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, okay. Okay, and then there's a few just like sort of, sort of circumstantial Are these ones bribes that give legal, you a though? flavor of how this works. Like this guy who sold his family's land to Qatar a year after the vote for 27 million pounds, which was like way over asking price. And this executive committee member, whose son was given a job at a private Qatari hospital shortly after the World Cup vote. Both of these guys, of course, like everyone else on this list, denies any connection that this was influence. But now we're at the what? most significant moment in all of this, the thing that really tipped the scales for the vote. And it has to do with this confederation, the most powerful, the European confederation. Specifically oh this God. guy, Michel Platini, a former French I just, football- uh, I just made so, a vote, hard in a, a vote, yes, this, is, try this, hard this isn't fucking the elections, dude. If, yeah, guys, if I say, Chat, vote for me for streamies, I'll give you one dollar, okay? I'm not gonna go jump for it. Player turned FIFA guy. He was the president of this confederation, which inevitably meant that he has sway over these other dudes. Just one week before the vote, like crunch time, Platini got an invitation that he couldn't refuse. A luncheon with the French president at his palace. Platini later said that before this meeting, he was planning on voting for the US to host the World Cup in 2022. But he goes to this luncheon, and who else is there? No, no big deal. Just these two guys, the most powerful dudes in Qatar. One of them, the prime minister of Qatar and the other, the current emir of Qatar from like the old dynasty family. It's important to remember the context here. Like what's happening? This is 2010. The world has just been rattled by a global financial meltdown. Jesus. And Hi. the president of France, Sarkozy, is stressed. 
and he's in the room with the leaders of Qatar, who are not nearly in the same financial uh, trouble. See the section before about unlimited amounts of money thanks to Jesus. fossil fuels. And it's clear that these Qataris want something, something that the Frenchmen in the room can deliver them, a vote for their country to host the World Cup, something they really want. According to sources close to this meeting, Sarkozy flat out told Platini to vote for Qatar. Why? Well, we'll never know. But it's clear that he wanted a few things from Qatar. In this same meeting, sure can... Sarkozy told the Qataris that he wanted Qatar to buy the French football team Paris Saint-Germain, which happens to be Sarkozy's favorite it's football team, and at the time man. was in financial ruin. After this meeting, a few important things happen. Number one, Qatar did end up buying that football team huh? for 60 million pounds, just like Sarkozy wanted. Wait, they that's turned it? it around, and soon it became a star-studded team with merch that's worn by the world's most popular celebrities. And then we suddenly see an uptick in big trade deals between. Bro, why is everything so cheap? How is everything so cheap? In Qatar and France, Qatar Airways buys 50 giant planes from Airbus, the giant French airplane maker. The I whole mean, squad for 60 mil. In 2010, times it by 50. We're looking at $18 billion, a massive deal. And in the end, Platini in this room, with his president telling him to do ago. what the Qataris want, we need them right now. And it worked. Michel Platini flipped his vote from the USA okay. to Qatar. Okay, let's do it again. Chat, guys, who's the best player on, on PSG? Isn't it fucking uh, um, M PayPal? How, how much is his contract worth? He admitted it later, that's not even speculation. M the president of the executive committee, Sepp Blatter, was pissed about this and later said that this uh, was the M defining Pipel, um, for Qatar winning. Contract. They have influenced uh, Michel Platini at that time uh, to vote for Qatar. Because it's remember, Messiah? Platini then went back Messiah to his European contract. Confederation with eight executive committee members, eight votes, and he almost certainly Big influenced others to join. Okay, yeah. okay. Messiah's contract is worth 110 mil over over the life of three-year deal, 110 million. His squad entirely, the club, is they bought it for 60. Him. One book I read claims that he took four votes with him, but we'll never know. And then, on a cold day in December of 2010, the day of the vote came. The 2022 FIFA World Cup. So on that matter. fateful day in the winter of 2010 in Zurich, all the guests arrive because it was voting day. Clearly, I think we have absolutely fantastic. Why is Morgan Freeman there? Is why and why is a Boris Johnson there? Fantastic bid. Well, we got a great bid, so we just got to go in there and give it everything that we've got. These 22 men cast their votes in multiple rounds until a majority victor emerged. At least 11 of them voted from Qatar since round one, and finally, 14 votes were delivered to Qatar. A majority. That's not even close. Double what the USA. That's yeah, not even close. <laughs> So yeah, that's how it went down. That's how it went down. Well, boys, like, look, we'll never know exactly what happened. In a lot four of this years, stuff we know because it leaked out, and we were able to put the it all together. The whole squad is going to Laval but or Montreal. The fact is, every one of these men has I'm buying that shit, been then. involved in some corruption investigation. I mean, it's no surprise that this stuff happened, and probably so much more. FIFA is corrupt to the core. Qatar didn't make this happen. Qatar just saw an organization that spoke their language, the language of unlimited money. And they used that to get what they wanted, to prepare for the future, to diversify, to get the world to look at them. It is the biggest event in the world. So no, this isn't just a game. The reason why all of this matters is because football can be a beautiful thing. No matter what language someone speaks, or their politics, or their god, or whatever, they have this universal language, this game, a global culture on, full of screaming and head. cheering and crying and pride and identity. It's ridiculous, yet Jesus. so beautiful, so uniquely human. And in a very real way, football is uh -oh. a mirror to the world. Oh, what's damn. acceptable here, in this most revered sport, is what's acceptable everywhere. So, by using money and influence to get the bid for the World Cup, Qatar showed us just how power works in our world. They showed us who really matters and who doesn't, and validated an old idea that the rules of fair play don't really matter if you have enough money. 
Hey, thanks for watching and for sticking yeah, around to yeah, the end of the video. Chat, this chat, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very important to chat. We watch this video, okay, chat, because all of this, right? It's bad, but it doesn't, it doesn't like really. You know, oh, why is it bad? And part two is why is that bad? And I think they're, they're gonna tell you, okay? Because they're like, oh yeah, they bought it. They have the money. Cool, man. That and it's also people said that. Yo, dude. I mean, they have the money and they can buy it. What's the problem? Here's the problem. Let's watch it. Hey, for Kutsa! We found something in our reporting. Something happening here in the one big city in Qatar. A place the whole world is looking at right now. An invisible border drawn to trap human beings, to make them work, to make them build. I want to show this to you. So let me take you back to show you how we ended up sending a camera to someone again, and teaching them how to shoot undercover in Qatar. About While Qatar. Simon, uh, I'd love to talk about it from a citizen point of view. I don't think I don't think I don't think you're citizen point. It, it, don't, don't, I'm gonna guess, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Rural Nepal and how I respect you. Here, I don't know the guy, but staring for hours at maps drawn by the Qatar government. All of this to shine a light on something that Qatar doesn't want the world to see. All of these have been emptied very recently. Hey, I need to show you something. I've been looking at maps of Qatar because the World Cup is going there. When the world is gonna be fixated on one place, you gotta look at all the maps. I've been on the government website of Qatar looking at their zoning maps. What this is the city of Doha, the capital of Qatar. But look at this. The whole city is yellow, and there's this one little shape of blue. Doha L. industrial area. I know we're talking about zoning. I think something's up here. I've been trying to map this, like throw it on like my other tools to map it and see if there's like what this could be. And it's not totally making sense. It's kind of cut off from the rest of the city. There's another municipality kind of in between it and Doha, but it's a part of Doha. Usually when you have weird zoning like this, there's something going on. Since Qatar got awarded the World Cup in 2010, there's been all sorts of issues with their labor conditions and all of that. And I think this has to do with that, but I don't totally know. The World Cup is happening in a few weeks. I want to go to this place. I need to reach out to Cami, one of our research producers. We're going to dive into this. We're going to figure it out. We're going to Doha, folks. Hey, Cami, I want to go to Qatar before the World Cup to look at this one part of the city that's completely zoned differently. I think it has to do with like the labor situation there. I can't not print it. I'm going. Interesting. There. We have to find a fixer, local producer, someone on the ground who can help us not get arrested. I will follow up tomorrow with more details. I, I would, I would, Going to guitar. Dude, this guy's got balls for sure though, I feel like. Yeah, yes, let's do it. This sounds like a really great story. I'll happily go to Doha with you. I'll start researching right now. I'm going to Qatar. Congratulations. I just want you to be smart. I've been doing some research and I don't know how easy it's gonna be for us to film places, especially in the industrial area. From what I've read, they're notoriously not very kind to journalists. Uh -oh. The best part about the Gulf is that these cities are like so like cartoonish. This is a hotel in freaking Doha. Look at this. Opening later this year. That's sick Can though. Can I stay in this hotel that looks like a freaking Hey, half yo, that's I've sick. Let's do this. I've never had an excuse. Doha Fixer number one referred me to someone else, so fingers crossed that. Guys, yeah, doubling at Cox, man. What is on this chat, man? Drones? Yes. Do you think they'll let me fly my drone in uh, drone. Doha? Drone! No. Why? NATO countries are helping out doing anti drone stuff because they're afraid of, you know, oh, drones damn! coming in. So Wait, like, but what about just my DJI drone? They're sending out anti drone. Holy shit! Drone. Wait, what? Yeah, I'll Okay, not great news. Our fixer hasn't found anybody in the industrial area who wants to talk with us. It's not looking likely that they're going to find anybody. I'm gonna keep trying to connect with anyone on the ground. I think it's a high anti drone. But I'm trying to find a fixer to help me get in there. You're gonna go in. What if your yes. drone is EMPing their drone? I mean, it's, just a, it's not like some secret. Part. You're supposed to be leaving in a week, and we haven't found any fixers. We haven't found any people on the ground who could help us. I'm just a bit concerned of our timeline right now. We found someone, a fixer, who is deeply connected with the worker population in Doha and is potentially going to help us to get into Jerome the Jerome Moore sounds fun. I, no, he doesn't. I'm on a call in a few minutes. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Fine. Let, let me switch off the AC. 
did you get the uh, proposal that we sent over of what yeah, we're, proposal like, I, I would... we're not trying to get any secretive footage it's more just about life in the industrial area i guess my question for you is like if i went into an industrial area with my camera not a big crew but just my camera to go film what what camera like this if i went into the industrial area with this camera mm -hmm. and film <laughs> yeah and... another thing your skin color is also a problem you know ah explain that what do you mean yeah it, it will make you know you, you will get undue attention from who do you think i would get undue attention you know oh, of course uh, the informers uh, and you know this makes this sense steel area ancient towns are patrolled by general security forces alphas are police so it's not very smart for me to go filming around in that area yeah okay and i think that's why we want to figure out a way have you ever been to doha i mean no. in Qatar? it's my first time <clears throat> what do you think this guy's like nah okay um he, he didn't go this is not happening i knew it i called it this is not happening it does if if we can't do the shots, then the story doesn't work. Meaning I won't go to Doha. So it's pretty important for us to know soon if this is feasible or if it's not feasible. Is, can you? Yeah, yeah, I understand, I understand. Well, it's really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for chatting. I can't safely go into this industrial area. Like it's now clear to me, like every fixer has just been like, no. This guy just said it point blank. He's so like, what's a fixer? you're a white dude with a camera. Like, this is this is not safe. It feels like if you go, you're just gonna what get shots of shiny buildings and not actually gain access. Yeah. Which I guess could be cool. No. I mean, there's an option here where you try to find someone that could go in. I, I, I tip her. Like I tip a her. camera person in Nepal or Bangladesh or somewhere where workers have been and gone home, we could totally tell this story. The, the World Cup is literally a few weeks away. I got some work to do. The new plan, find someone on the ground in Qatar who will go into the industrial area and tell me why the hell the government is so afraid of, of me going in with my camera. Why, why one guy though? Why don't you get five of them? Okay. Okay. Before we continue, I need to tell you about something uh, which is that today's video is not sponsored by any brand. Sometimes we do really deep dives into Yeah, 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 I get it. It doesn't want to be monetized topics. because it's a sensitive topic. Yes, I get it. But I'm going to keep doing it. That's where you all come in. For those who are supporting over at the newsroom, you allow us to do this kind of journey. It's one of my scripts every month. And you get access to some exclusive Tom Fox group here on YouTube into this story and Pac-Man page on juice Qatar Boom. is a tiny super rich country I'll, I'll let you desert, go chat. and it sits on the largest known natural gas field yeah. on earth since their independence in 1970 Qatar got really rich really fast leapfrogging the normal economic development process that countries go through as they grow usually as a country gets rich it's immigrants from poorer neighboring countries migrate in to take lower paying jobs required to keep the economy growing yeah, this is construction yeah. hospitality manual labor caretaking food services you know what I mean. Every rich country experiences this. But in Qatar, all of their neighbors were also getting super rich super fast. So they started looking elsewhere for cheap labor. And soon there was a flow of people taking these jobs. But there's a That's... tension here. Thanks to all this abundant oil and gas money, the Qatari government provides a luxurious welfare state to their citizens. Free healthcare, education, guaranteed jobs, subsidized housing, and literally they just get yeah, paychecks for being Qatari, for winning the fossil fuel jackpot. So Qatar needed labor from other countries, but they didn't want to let these immigrants in on the sumptuous benefits of their welfare state. So they started using this system where employers could sponsor workers to come to Qatar to work. They wouldn't be citizens or anything close to it. They would be totally at the mercy of their employer. This was called the Kafala system, and it was the foundation upon which Qatar built its country. The winner to organize the 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. So this is a giant moment. It's this, this I mean, is not, I made a whole video about it's how not this surprising happened. or shocking, it's just capitalism, really. But the fact is that as soon as Qatar won the World Cup, take it in your hands. They had a lot of work to do. 
is their country didn't have a lot of infrastructure, basically what? any what? infrastructure at all, to host it's this. It's why it needs to be laws. It's why there needs to be regulations or whatever the fuck, right? But technically, on paper, what if I did it? What, 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 what if I hired somebody, a guy uh, or a girl, and make them sit in the corner there without a break for 10 hours a day? Boom. Hey, yo, do that, right? Thing. So wait. No, people do that, right? Because this is fucking dumb. But what if I say, yo, I'll pay you $160 an hour? Wait, why were they chosen to host the World Cup if they didn't have any infrastructure? It's a long story. Again, I made an entire video about it. The fact is, they and, needed and in their to country, build a bunch of stuff. They make like 10 cents So what an they hour. basically did is just ramp up the system that they already had, importing tons of labor from South. Look at this chat. Look at this chat. Who's gonna do it? Look at this chat. I'll do it. I'll do it. Everybody will fucking do it. Oh my god! Oh my god! What the fuck is that? To come build their country, in this case, to build infrastructure for the World Cup. So yeah, I've been deep in the context and the history and the data for all of this, the stuff I can do from the office. But the fact is, time is running out. I need to find someone on the today. ground, someone in Doha, someone in Bangladesh or Nepal, who can help me capture what is actually happening in these places, talk to the people there. I've been planting lots of seeds and some of them are starting to sprout. So we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Dromedaries, I like those. I've been talking with a journalist in Nepal who's really great and can connect us with workers who've returned home. He's done a lot of work on this and he can go out and it's shoot these interviews. I'm finally just settling into the fact that I'm not going to Doha and I'm disappointed in that because I wanted to be on the ground. I wanted to see this issue, but the right choice is to use those resources to engage camera people to go capture the right stories in different parts of the world, and that's what we're gonna do. Luckily, I've got Instagram. I also have miso soup. His oh! Thank you so much for really appreciate it. This guy's such a hipster, guys. I like this guy, but what a fucking hipster, man. Deep dive iPhone, beanie, the call out for fucking people in Doha. Little jars. Oh my god, bro. I was gonna be going to Qatar. I was gonna be there next week. I'm not going. I'm now looking for people on the ground to help me. And as always, a bunch of people responded. Standing I live in a world desk. where I can just ask for things. And there's such a supportive community who wants to help with these stories which is just an amazing reality. Probably 15 to 20 hours over the next two weeks getting some shots. Can I officially you know, hire you as a contractor to do this? And again, all of this is 100% anonymous. We will make sure that you, everyone is safe. Bingo. Yes, yes, yes. I am talking to somebody in Qatar who is a journalist who wants to help me out and is excited. Oh my God, I feel so much better. There was someone in Doha who has camera skills, who has okay. language skills, who has journalism skills, who is excited to help and is just ready to go. Oh my gosh, <laughs> nice to meet you. Hello. How you doing? Yeah, everything is great. Really appreciate you just like harnessing the, the energy on this and just being super down. And they have access to the industrial area. Yes. I want you to tell me how comfortable you feel about this process in terms of safety and security. What's sensitive, what's not. Just give me an overview of where some red lines are here. I found someone in Doha who I could give a camera to to film. We're gonna call him Raj. We won't be showing his face. We'll change his voice because he could get in deep trouble for this. First things first, everything is monitored. Or like surveillance works everywhere in this country. No matter where I film, I'm also being filmed. Specifically, if we come to the industrial area, there are a few layers to what we can do and what we cannot do. And over the next several weeks of talking to Raj, I realized that my fixation on this one blue square isn't actually the full story. It's just the beginning. I plan to go on every street and film from inside the car. And I think that's the safest way to film and get like the vibe of what is it like to get inside the city. <sighs> we have someone Let's on the ground it. with a camera that we bought them, I'd line them out on how to shoot undercover. I actually wanted to ask you like, how do you get along shooting footages without getting noticed? The key to filming without being seen is to look elsewhere. You're holding this thing, like you're holding a, a, an ice cream cone. You're yeah. walking around and you're looking elsewhere and then you just smoothly, you know, put it away and you just get really comfortable with turning it on and off. They're going to the What the fuck? Area. They are very, wait, very- Wait, why wouldn't you, why, wait, wait, why wouldn't they modify the car or have some contraption, right? Why did they make him do it manually? Cautious for a very good reason. I would like you to shoot in 60 frames a second. I'd like you to shoot in 4K. This is gonna be an amazing story if we can pull it off. Okay, go ahead. The government of Qatar is way more insane than I expected. And we're gonna take a lot of precautions to keep everyone safe. We're gonna show the world what 
Qatar doesn't want the world to see. So I'm taking an Uber because frankly it's very unsafe to go on a bus. This is the bus stop where you get on a bus to an initial area. How much time does it take for you to get here? Like, it could be like one and a half hour, right? Raj was finally heading to the industrial area to show us exactly what this place was. But it wasn't until we heard from the people who had worked there and lived there that we began to see how deep this trap really was. Huh? A trap? Today is the day. In Nepal, a million miles away, they have been shooting interviews. Look, these are people who actually worked on the World Cup stadiums and are now back home in Nepal. You start to get to the human side of it and it becomes way less theoretical. It's way less about these zoning maps and stuff, and it becomes about real humans, and the suspense cool. starts to get heavy. Uh. Financial situation. As we've been setting up all these logistics and figuring all of this out, we've also been reporting and investigating the bigger context here. The industrial area, this little blue shape on the map, is actually just one of several mechanisms that the Qatari government uses to bring people over to their country, to trap them there, oh. and then to exploit them to work, to build all the things they want them to build. Let me show Wait, you. Wait, chat, chat. Yes, I learned this in politics. Isn't it, they don't, sometimes they have a zone where things and laws are different than the main country. It's like something that is, it's different for this part or something like that. Okay, so it's 2010, Qatar just won the World Cup. Yeah, they, they yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfavorable amount it's of infrastructure thing. in a very short time. They do this by paying a bunch of people to go to these countries, to small villages in places like Bangladesh and Nepal, to recruit a bunch of workers to come to Qatar to build. And this is the first phase of what I'm calling the Qatar trap. Because it is here where these workers were told they had to pay a recruitment fee. Yeah, boom, here like it comes. One to four thousand dollars. Just to like get recruited to go to Qatar and work. These people don't have one to four thousand dollars lying around. So they often would borrow money from family or take out a loan with really high interest rates. So even before they start working, they start their relationship with work in Qatar with debt. So now you have workers from Bangladesh, India, Nepal, all over this region flooding into Qatar to start building. As this is happening, Qatar implements a law. This is a law that's meant to protect families, okay? The law says that worker wait, group- Wait, if you replace certain data, isn't that how it is though with, with, uh, with even in other countries? Like if you have to pay a lot to, uh, you have to take loans out for education to get a job and then you get a job and you start with debts. Groups are well, not I get it allowed though, I get it to live within, quote, family areas I get in the though. city of Doha. It's a little ambiguous. Well, the government later clarified that what they're referring to is bachelors. People in Qatar that are single men. Okay, so these bachelors can't live in family zones. Where are these family zones that bachelors can't live in? Is it just like one little part of the city? No. To clarify, they released a map that looks like this. Everything in yellow is a family zone a place where bachelor workers are not allowed to live. If you project it onto like a real map, you will see that this is the entire city, basically. And then they reserved one little plot of land, a city away, still zoned for Doha, this little blue shape where these bachelor workers can live. Oh, but they made a few exceptions. Anyone who works at like markets and barber shops, restaurants, oh, and white collar professionals who are bachelors can also stay in the family zones. So really these working bachelors is just a euphemism for guys who look like this. Guys who are there doing construction, who Qatar does not want to see in their shiny downtown area. So they reserved them a spot out here in the desert next to the sewage pond. This is the map that sent me down the rabbit hole and now I see it for what it is. I knew something was up. I look at a bunch of these zoning maps. They're using this to put the people that they don't want to see in the places that will never be seen. So now these guys are already laden with debt because of the recruiting fees. And now they're relegated and trapped into this part of the city. 
the part of the city that I was not allowed okay. to go to. With Remember that hour listening? Basically, these guys, okay, they're coming from other countries, they're literally paying money that they don't have, right? In order to get a job to make money for their families. Without getting arrested. This is where Raj is on his way to. This is where we're getting footage. Hey, I'm just, I'm just doing a chat, man. Relax. 15 minutes into the ride, and we're Heck kind man. of starting to see these kind of accommodations where the workers live. This is one of those buses that the poro workers that live in the industry are using to commute. Poro PLS, Poro PLS, Poro PLS. Today is Friday, and it's a leisure day for a lot of workers. As you can see, a lot of clothes that have been washed and left in the sun to be dried. So this is the industrial area. It's the thing I've been Looks thinking about for a very long time. And I'm finally seeing the footage from inside. And I have to say, it's not anything super surprising. It's, this is kind of anticlimactic in the sense that I'm just looking at like a kind of dusty, dilapidated part of town with a bunch of buildings that look the same. And yet, I now know a lot more about what this place represents. Look at this. The industrial area is not just far away. Name, it's completely cut off. Here's the metro system, brand new, that they were planning to build for the World Cup. This is the whole system, connects all of the stadiums and the, the city. You can see that they planned a couple of these lines to go out to the industrial area. This would connect the industrial area to the city. And yet, these lines aren't actually built. They're gonna start on these right after the World Cup is over. So yeah, this place is just like, completely disconnected. I think I now see that, and it's not just disconnected unintentionally. This is very systematically, intentionally disconnected from the rest of the city. Our interviews in Nepal gave us some clarity on what it's like to live out there. Poor mouse, it's getting clicked on so hard. Uh, the next phase of the Qatar trap has to do with how these people were exploited, how their rights were taken away from them to force them to work. To build the World Cup, these workers were forced to work in very horrible conditions. Look at the temperatures in Doha in the summer. Getting close to 50 degrees Celsius, close to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Wait, what they the fuck? They literally have air conditioned outdoor spaces. Look at that, air conditioning outside on wheels. The stadiums themselves will have air conditioning. And yet these workers are out there doing like manual labor in this heat. <laughs> A lot of workers report being treated like animals, being yelled at and bossed around in totally It's really chat says, oh, did you get chat this, did you get chat that? These guys are the real did you get chats. For me, I said, 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 Behind these walls, the conditions it's that true. these people were made to live in and really given no choice on where they could live are horrendous. Toilet bathroom was a very good thing. Journalists and human rights organizations have actually gotten cameras back here to actually show what that looks like. Holy the fuck! heat and conditions got so bad for some workers that they never returned home. Oh. Thousands of totally healthy young men died while working in these conditions. Wait, how many? We'll likely never know the. Wait, how many? Thousands of Thousands. totally healthy young men died 
while working in these conditions. We'll likely never know the true cause of death because instead of a real investigation, the Qatari authorities come out and use these vague classifications like heart failure and natural causes as the cause of death. Doing this robs the family of answers on why their loved one came home in a box. So if these employers are so bad, why don't these employees just change jobs? The answer is they can't. For a long time, legally, they couldn't. Because the next part of this trap has to do with paperwork. Oh my god! Oftentimes this paperwork would stipulate that these workers can't change jobs without the permission of their employers. So the status of these workers who were trapped in their little blue box on the outskirts of the city was completely at the mercy of their employers. If they left their job, they would be considered a foreign immigrant illegally there and could be arrested and put into jail. Just one more layer of the trap. And then there was the fact that these employers would often not pay their workers for months at a time, withholding wages from them and thus increasing their leverage and power over them. And with no recourse, these workers couldn't do anything about it. So yes, we are now talking about forced labor Jesus, with no compensation. A euphemism for modern day slavery. I know that sounds dramatic, but that's literally what is happening here. Not to all workers. There were workers who had great conditions and who got paid on time, but this system enabled firms to so deeply exploit workers because it gave them so much power over them and so little recourse for these workers to complain or do anything without being punished or arrested. So with no other options, some workers turned to their last resort, uh -oh. protesting. Okay, they are blocking traffic. Central Doha. But don't be fooled here. This wasn't some worker uprising. This type of thing is illegal in Qatar, an authoritarian police state where assembly like this is totally not okay. So what would happen is the police would show up, squash these protests, tell them that everything was gonna be okay and they would get paid, and then deported a huge number of these people, got them out of the system so that the status quo could remain just dehumanizing people that belong to a certain race uh, and are brought here for certain purposes is not justified by any means. Thanks to international scrutiny, Qatar started to make some reforms. They realized this wasn't gonna fly if they were gonna host the World Cup. So they started instituting things like worker hours that were not in the heat of the day, mandatory water on site so these people could stay hydrated, a minimum wage, changing the law so that people could technically change jobs without permission compensating families for people who died working. All of this looked great on paper, but human rights organizations like Amnesty International actually have looked to see if those policies have trickled into reality. And you know what I'm gonna say, they haven't. Well, it's not only great, I mean, this they can't afford it though, that's a problem. This is big walls, and a lot of people live here as well. I'm saying the, pe the, the people, the, the people that, that are doing all this, that are making all this, they can't afford to make things better. But that, but that, but that, it wouldn't even be that much. So yeah, I really understand now what this little blue box is for, what it represents. The authorities in Doha are getting ready for this World Cup. And as the event approaches, they are making sure that anyone who belongs can, in this box can, can. stays in that box. They okay. can. Can. This is insane, the timing of this. This is literally happening right now. The whole thing has just been wiped out by some weird phenomenon. A like phenomenon! A message from Raj that um, they are evicting workers from the city, people who are living in the yellow area illegally because of the law are being evicted. It's a couple weeks before the World Cup, and so the timing is not surprising that they are, are cracking down. Smokes everywhere. 
everything looks like it has been done really quick. They're literally catching people and putting them into Shania, which is the initial area. I'm trying to get footages of them being evicted because a lot of them are being evicted like just with two hours of notice. That's what get I'm trying to do now. This is so clear to me what's happening. They're clearly starting to uh, really enforce this like family zoning thing to get anyone who they don't want to be 26 seen months out six, of QC the center of the city. I've never done a story like this before. This is developing like day by day. And all of this reporting that we've done, I'm now seeing it play out in, in real time as the city prepares for the World Cup, using all Faded of these laws to Faded continue to hide these people, to get them out of view as all of these international visitors. I thought this was, this was crazy of a story, man. It feels so empty. And it's only the small houses that have been evacuated. Got to the bottom of it. Is that, is that, is that? We know why this exists, the way it's drawn, what it means, hmm? who it's for, what it's meant to do. I did not expect that. I know what's happening behind those walls, how those people are trapped, how their families miss them, and how some of them might never come home. That was a no boy, they used to burn up Taiko boy, the hin, eat it home person of Taiko boy, the hin, did it, but you were cuisine, him, so that's what you were cuisine. What chat was that like 6k deaths or something like that for, 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 uh, from the project? How much did I tell you guys? You know, when I said it's not a lot, when they said like 14 guys at like 1.5 mil a pop, right? How much is that in terms of money? One, uh, 14 times uh, over 5 mil, it'd be like uh, 18 mil, 18 mil. For 18 mil damage, for 18 mil dollars, that's that much damage that they could cause. That's in, that's insane. By comparison, the, 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 the gravity of the damage for 21 mil is crazy. Now let's be clear, this happened well before the World Cup ever came to Qatar. And what I fear is that once we all move on, once these few weeks of playing football are over, we'll forget about everything we saw. And Qatar will have no incentive to actually do anything about this. And they'll go back to what they've been what doing for decades. Say? Deceiving these workers, trapping them in their country, exploiting them, and then hiding them from view. So, yeah. There you go. That, that, that wasn't like, I mean, it was pretty, pretty depressing, but I think it's it a good video.